having me. So you, you call the book FobDoc, um, Forward Operating Base. How is the experience at a forward operating base, which tend to be pretty remote, different than the experience back at the main base, which it, it, for the Canadians would, would have been Kandahar? Mm -hmm. Well, of the 2,800 Canadians who are deployed to Afghanistan at any one time, only a third of them go outside the wire into the combat area. And it's an area where doctors almost never go. I was only sent out there because, as you said, of my prior combat training. Uh, the fact for the past five years I've been the doctor for our SWAT team and I've got a lot of experience in developing world conflict zones as an unarmed medic or unarmed doctor. So I had a degree of comfort with that environment and when the Canadian Forces had some gaps in coverage there, I was the obvious person to fill those gaps. The experience is quite different. The, hospital at CAF, at the Kandahar Airfield, the main coalition hospital in southern Afghanistan, is not unlike a modern version of MASH, operating rooms, surgeons. A lot of high-tech. A lot of high-tech. CT scanners there, ultrasound machines are there, etc. Uh, at the FOB, it's pretty limited. But I've got everything I need for that first half hour of resuscitation care until the helicopter comes to take them to CAF. But you actually went even beyond just being the doctor base at the FOB. You went on yeah. patrols, I mean, there was there were even incidents where where your convoy hit an IED yeah. and you were on site, correct? Yeah, yeah. The uh, I took my turn in the rotation with the other combat medics who were covering the absences of the, of the or not the absence, but the missions of the, the troops at the FOB. The FOB is our, our little base out in the most Taliban uh, supporting area in the country, but we do not spend all our time there. We go out from there on operations to disrupt the Taliban right where they live. And, so. and what kind of injuries were, were typical? Well, as you know, most of our injuries are caused by IEDs. It's extremely unusual These for are the improvised? Improvised explosive devices, sorry, or roadside bombs. It's extremely unusual for a Canadian soldier to be killed by direct Taliban gunfire. And the last time it happened was July of 08. Before that, October of 06. When we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Taliban, Generally, they die and we come out without a scratch. So we get wounded by mines, roadside bombs, etc., which if they don't kill the patient immediately, uh, tend to leave them with quite severe lower limb wounds. And I mean, there's some pretty graphic yeah. photographs yeah, there in, your, in your book. Well, I mean, I'm with trying to be honest. The trails yeah. out of the body. I mean, that's, yeah. is that pretty common? That's, that does happen, yeah. When, when shrapnel goes into the abdomen, it, it tends to open you up like a can of sardines. And I'm being honest about what, what's going on there, our losses, our successes our failures and our, our victories. When that happens, what's the chance of survival? Well, I got to tell you, our, our rule, our motto in the health services is if, if you arrive alive, you will survive. And that's a promise we've been able to keep to virtually every Canadian who's been hit in Afghanistan and the vast majority of coalition soldiers. Pretty amazing. And the, the quality of medical care that the Canadian Forces delivers was, was frankly a shock to me when I went for my first tour. Uh, I couldn't believe how good it was. The, the kids I was working with, us, who were my combat medics assigned to the FOB, who were working right at the point of injury on the battlefield, uh, were extraordinarily good, like working with a third-year resident in emergency medicine. Hmm. Now, when you have uh, an IED attack, you're sometimes in the middle of nowhere, you need air support mm -hmm. to get back. Mm -hmm. Were you reliant mostly on, on other NATO, like American air support? Uh, on my first tour, yeah, it was all American airframes that were And were they get us. pretty responsive? Extremely. I know the Brits have complained that the Americans haven't responded at times. No, I, honestly, I, we were had a very good relationship with American medevac. And same thing, and then on our second tour, obviously by then, in February of 2009, the Canadian helicopters had arrived. And for most of my second tour, we were strongly supported by Canadian helicopters who were equally responsive. Uh, although, again, a lot of the medevac was still done by the Americans. Um, if you can't get a helicopter in, what, what happens? Well, the only times that would happen would be when we were medevac red uh, because of weather, uh, dust storms being the most common cause. And when that would happen, we would tend to pull back our operations uh, precisely so that we would always have medical coverage. And there were times, though, when we would have to evacuate people by road, but that was a very, very small minority. You mentioned MASH before. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. show really popularized this whole idea sure. of of combat medicine, and there was a in the show. There was this great sense of camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, it, out at a fob, hundred guys, couple hundred couple guys. Hundred, yeah. uh, I mean, it, I can imagine there must be this amazing sense of unity among amongst you guys. Take take mash and multiply it because multiply it by ten because we're 
we don't just have the camaraderie of the, the difficulty, the, the stressful environment of you know, the marginal living conditions and the stress of patients coming in. We also have the stress of combat. So yeah, you can, you can multiply what you saw in NASH by 10 right. you know, to get a sense of what it's like to be a, on a combat team at a FOB. Right. Well, one, one thing in, in MASH, just going back to the movie, uh, the show, is you know, they would be, this is based on the Korean War, they, they would be treating American soldiers who were hit and also Korean civilians or Korean soldiers who were mm -hmm. hit. Um, you guys uh, treat Canadian soldiers who were hit as well as local Afghans who might be hit or yeah. Taliban guys. Absolutely. Um, I think it's a difficult for people to genuinely believe that you treat all of those people the same, that you triage them in a very scientific way, if two injuries come in and the Taliban guy is, is hit worse than the Canadian soldier, you treat the Taliban guy first? Absolutely. Yeah. And that shouldn't be surprising, really. The, we're fighting this war in a moral manner. This is, in my opinion, a moral war, a rare example of a war that actually has very solid moral underpinnings. And that's how you fight a moral war, in a moral manner. And because it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. If you treat captured enemy well, number one, they will tend to surrender more quickly rather than fight to the death. And number two, as sometimes happens, they will turn around and inform on their former colleagues. Remember, they've been told all their lives that we are these evil people who are coming in to do evil things. And when they see us treat them well, knowing full well that when they capture somebody, they torture them to death, uh, they, they sometimes make a 180 degree turnaround and, and start giving us information. Yeah, I've talked to some of these detainees. They, pretty much every single one of them assumes that they're going to be tortured when they... Yeah. Oh, and you see it. When they come yeah. into the FOB wounded, they're terrified. Yeah. And they think what's going to happen is going to hurt. And, and initially it does because I'm giving them anesthetic. I'm injecting local anesthetic before I do a small operation or something. And you see the fear and then, and then almost puzzlement follows. But you must blow their minds when, oh, when yeah. you've just exploded yeah. what they've been mm -hmm. told all, all their entire lives. Well, to the point so much. I mean, I always made a point of always telling them, we're Canadians, we've done well by you. Uh, that seems to have had an impact. There's not just my words, but all of it. Because on my second tour, on a couple of occasions, we actually found uh, wounded Taliban who'd been placed in the path of one of our convoys by their commanders because they knew the Canadians would find them, pick them up, and take good care of them. Right. So they would they would assume that you guys would take better care than... than well, we've, we've intercepted their yeah. communication. They said, oh, you, you can't take care of Mohammed. Put him on this road. There's a Canadian convoy yeah. going to go by. They'll pick him up. They'll take good care of him. And that must hurt their own morale, because if they're trying to tell their guys that you guys are the enemy, and all of at, a sudden they're handing you over to the enemy. At, at some point, the internal contradiction there has got to tear them apart. They can't be told that we're evil, and then at the same time be told, well, put your wounded where the Canadians will pick them up because they'll be well taken care of. That, that internal contradiction is going to tear them apart someday, as it does all totalitarian governments. Well, you know, clearly, when, when an enemy comes in your hands, you treat them well, and the vast, vast, vast majority of uh, NATO forces treat, treat them well. Uh, but there has, has been information recently from a former Canadian diplomat that, mm -hmm. that some Taliban members who were captured were handed over to Afghan authorities and, and tortured. Um, I'm curious what, if you've seen any of that, if you believe that that's happened, and what that does to, to the morale of, of our soldiers. Well, I never actually saw any of it myself. I had, again, I was in the combat area, right. and all of this is alleged to have happened in the prisoner of war camps right. back in Kandahar City. I think there is almost certainly some uh, great deal of truth to that. In 2006, when we first arrived in Kandahar province, there was clearly a sea change in 2007 when we became fully aware of this. And that doesn't seem to be coming out a lot in the, in the debate, but I think the honest answer is there was a lot of it going on. We stopped transferring detainees to the Afghans, told them to Spartan up in 07, and certainly in 08 and 09, I don't think you can find the evidence of that happening anymore. And that's the whole point. We're there to educate Afghanistan, to change the way they are through education. And that's done by opening up thousands and thousands of schools, something you rarely hear about in Canada, but also influencing their government to reduce corruption, to improve their human rights record. And clearly in this area we have. So you know, I think the honest answer to that is it was definitely happening. It, if it's happening now, it's happening very little. Well, this war is changing constantly. Um, you, you characterize it as a moral war, mm -hmm. which is not how many Canadian politicians characterize it, some who have been on the show. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Sure. Um, more with Dr. Ray Riss when the standard returns. <laughs>